All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and a very warm welcome on this feels like a summer day in Washington, D.C. I'm uh, Matthias Mateis. I'm the uh, faculty lead for Europe and Eurasia at SAIS and also an associate professor for international political economy. It's a busy week uh, for all of us, so we appreciate you making the time. But it's a particular uh, honor for me as, as faculty lead for Europe to, to invite uh, former prime minister and current commissioner, Paolo Gentiloni. The Honorable Paolo Gentiloni is the European Commissioner for Economy since December 2019, uh, as the von der Leyen, the, the geopolitical commission, I should say, under von der Leyen took, uh, took office in, in Brussels. He previously served as Prime Minister of, of Italy from 2016 to uh, 2018, also Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation right before, from 14 to, to 16, during the Matteo Renzi government, and was a member of the Committee on, uh, on Foreign Affairs and Minister of Communications. Uh, previously must have been the Romano Prodi government from 2006 to 2008. He was formerly spokesperson for the Margarita Party from 2002 to 2007, chairman of the Broadcasting Services Watchdog Committee, and spokesperson for the Mayor of Rome, kind of been an easy job, and a commissioner in the city of Rome from in, in the 1990s. He also worked uh, as a professional uh, journalist. He graduated in political science from La Sapienza in, in Rome, and his latest book is La Sfida Impopulista, the Unpopulist Challenge. Commissioner Gentiloni is going to make uh, opening remarks from the podium here, and then he'll be joined by uh, our very own uh, Dr. John Lipsky, the Peter G. Peterson uh, Fellow at the Kissinger Institute, who's going to enjoy him in conversation. There'll hopefully be time, uh, at least hopefully at least 15 minutes for, for, for Q&A, and then I think we'll have to end promptly at 4 o'clock, correct? All right. Commissioner, welcome. So, good afternoon, uh, Professor Mateis, dear John Lipsky, dear students. Real pleasure to be here today with you in this uh, one of the most prestigious universities. Um, there is, of course, a before and a after uh, February 24, the, the day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, which was an inflection point in world history, as uh, President Biden uh, said. For Europe, it certainly marked the end of an age of innocence, in a certain sense. Uh, if we compare what we were saying 20 years ago, uh, when we presented our first uh, EU security strategy, this strategy opened with uh, the following words. Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. The violence of the first half of the 20th century has given way to a period of peace and stability unprecedented in European history. 20 years after the same exercise, of our what we call now strategic compass, but it is exactly the same thing 20 years after this is the initial words. We live in a world shaped by raw power politics where everything is weaponized and where we face a fierce battle of narratives. This is only to, to say how things have changed in these 20 years. And indeed, in recent years, China, Russia, and other major global players have become more repressive at home and more assertive abroad. The global spread of democracy has gone into reverse. Trade tensions, especially between the US and China, have been brewing, and globalization has been faltering. And Russia's invasion has dramatically accelerated all these trends. From a geopolitical perspective, the war has forced a realignment of alliances. The invasion was met with extraordinary unity, both within Europe and across the Atlantic. It has strengthened transatlantic relations and reinvigorated NATO. You know that Finland entered NATO and Sweden will. But globally, the picture was not so clear cut. Yes, an overwhelming majority of countries, 141, voted in favor of a UN resolution condemning the aggression 
Yet 35 countries, roughly half of the world population, chose to abstain, including China, India, and South Africa, that are part of the G20. Agreeing on sanctions against Russia has led bear a division between what some call the West and the rest. Only G7 countries and a handful of others have imposed sanctions. No developing country has done so, despite being more exposed to the food and energy insecurity caused by the war. In this context, the G7 has proved to be an effective forum to coordinate our response to Russia's aggression and our support to Ukraine. It pushed strongly for the recently agreed IMF program for Ukraine, the approval of which was certainly not a given. So Western unity remains essential, but to make progress on global issues, we need to build wider coalitions. The big players of the global south will likely push for a more multipolar than bipolar world and smaller developing countries might simply prefer to stay on the fence and not take sides. From a geoeconomic perspective, the war, and before it, the pandemic, are triggering a fundamental rethink of economic relations and dependencies. We have seen all too clearly in Europe that economic inter interdependence may actually be used against you. Energy dependence was a crystal clear case. It is too early to say whether globalization is heading into reverse. So far, the evidence seems to suggest that rather than deglobalization, we are seeing changing patterns of globalization. Geopolitical factors and the need to secure critical production inputs and technologies will likely play a more prominent role in how global supply chains are structured. To use the buzzword of the day, we can expect to see more reshoring, nearshoring, and perhaps what some call friends shoring. How this affect Europe? Europe is an open export-oriented economy that has greatly benefited from the march of globalization. Retreating within our borders or erecting trade barriers would be a mistake. We should work with our partners instead to make globalization safer, to build stronger, more resilient supply chains. As President von der Leyen recently put it, the goal should be de-risking, not de-coupling. Happy to discuss of this subject. The EU will need to walk the fine line of what we call open strategic autonomy, a typical Brussels uh, compromise, uh, Brussels agreement. No, strategic autonomy, but open. And this is how it is. Cooperating multilaterally whenever we can, acting autonomously wherever we must. Finding the right balance will not be easy, and a strong transatlantic partnership is key to achieve this balance. In conclusion, Rus Russia's war arguably marks the end of the post-Cold War era. Economic integration has proved to be a no safeguard against the power of revanchist ideas. We have learned that irrational does not mean impossible. Russia has challenged the rules-based international order and this is not a Western order. Difficult to explain this, to discuss this with our partners in the emerging economy. This is not a Western order. It is an order that allows all countries to cooperate, to prosper, and live peacefully side by side. An order where no country has 
to fear being attacked by a more powerful neighbor. An order, in short, that it is in everyone's interest to uphold. And that's why the West must remain united and unwavering in support of Ukraine. In the wake of the war, the world has become increasingly fragmented, more unpredictable, less secure. However, I believe this is not the last nail in the coffin of multilateralism and globalization. Economic interdependence remain a powerful force. Global challenges will require some form of international cooperation. And increased multipolarity opens opportunities for variable geometries of alliances on different topics. The green transformation is the clear example from this point of view. So I remain optimistic that progress on pressing global issues like poverty, climate change, or pandemic preparedness will remain possible. The groundbreaking international agreement on corporate taxation of one and a half years ago and the one on the protection of biodiversity at COP15 last December have shown that multilateralism is alive and can still deliver. It should encourage Europe and the West to pursue greater engagement with the global South. And the meetings that are here in Washington are a big opportunity from this point of view. Political engagement, diplomatic, cultural, and economic. As the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. And the second best time is now. Thank you. Well, thank you for those remarks. And uh, again, let me add my welcome and uh, gratitude that you've taken time out of a very busy schedule uh, to join us today. The, uh, I, I hardly know where to start. You've, you've put a lot of uh, ideas and a lot of uh, catchy phrases here uh, that I think we'll, we'll want to follow up. The, why don't we start with Ukraine? And one implication, the G7 continued to work, if anything, more cohesively than previously. And yesterday, the, G, the G7 finance ministers met and issued, a, I think they called it a statement, not a communique, that uh, included two long paragraphs or uh, some very uh, strong language on Ukraine, support for the IMF program, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, it's clear that the uh, Ukraine issue has been a roadblock to smooth uh, operations of the G20. The G20 was the principal institutional innovation, the G20 leaders, was the principal institutional innovation from the global financial crisis that has seemed to have ground to a halt. They met, the finance ministers met yesterday and today. Uh, I haven't heard, I don't know if you want to say anything about how, that, uh, how the meeting went, uh, whether there's going to be a statement, whether the, the sense is the G20 is going to start to work again uh, under the Indian G20 presidency to be able to, in fact, agree on, uh, if not on Ukraine, on other issues? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Lipsky, for, for uh, being here and for, for this conversation. Uh, well, indeed, yesterday the, the G7 was uh, very strongly, we, we had the, the Ukrainian finance minister Marchinko with us, and uh, it was very uh, clearly and strongly committing in uh, support to Ukraine uh, as long as it, it will be needed. Uh, and, well, I'm proud to say that the European Union, from this point of view, is very interesting. Uh, in two aspects. First, uh, we are supporting with a um, very important amount of money. Uh, if you look to the table of the principal supporters, EU uh, rank first. 
And second, because the unity on sanctions uh, was really a big political result. I was the Italian foreign minister after the Crimea annexation, and I may remember how difficult it was on very small packages of sanctions to agree unanimously. Uh, G20, I think we um, can uh, count of, on the fact that uh, there is a strong commitment from the Indian uh, presidency um, to, to keep the machine going in some of the results um, and the work stream that are there. Uh, and we have many. I don't want to, to enter into them. But of course, from taxation to, to multilateral development banks, etc. But at the same time, I think we can't ignore the fact that the Ukrainian crisis is uh, not only a geopolitical uh, story. Um, so we are working very hard to explain to our colleagues in the G20, those that are not part of the G7 or like-minded countries like Korea, Australia, or others, to explain the fact that this war is something uh, threatening the whole international uh, community, that the consequences of this war uh, are very serious from the economic point of view. They are not only a geopolitical or a security issue. And they are not a regional story. It is not a European story. Um, well, this discussion is, uh, of course, very important. And uh, it is not concluded, to be honest. Because we, we tried in, uh, in, in Bangalore uh, during the G20, the first meeting in India, uh, to agree on, in, a, in a communique. This was not possible. Um, this time, no communique was envisaged. Uh, but I think we have some progress. Uh, interesting, for example, to note that the next presidency will be taken by Brazil, and that Brazil changed his position um, in the uh, UN context from abstention to support to, to Ukraine. And this is interesting. But anyway, uh, the, the, the dialogue uh, is still going. And the role of India will be crucial, in my view, to try to find a, a, a balance. What we can't accept is that, well, we are finance ministers or central bankers what is for us the Ukrainian problem? This is, I think, completely unacceptable because the war has also uh, enormous economic consequences. Indeed. In fact, why don't we follow that, uh, that road for a minute or two? Uh, one of the consequences, or to say the war set, set off a series of economic and financial events that is uh, working out to the great detriment to many developing and emerging economies that are now facing either in or facing serious debt distress in a situation in which the pre-existing machinery for renegotiating and rescheduling and dealing with these kind of problems has essentially ground to a halt. The G20 responded with the common framework, which has generally been seen as not working or not working anywhere near well enough to provide a solution. Do you see progress in this area? And as you, I'm sure you're very well aware, uh, the, what we've seen as of yesterday, a new initiative by the bank, the fund, and the Indian presidency of the G20 to create this uh, working group on, uh, on debt issues. 
do you see movement or are we going to have a stalemate that reflects great power conflict? Well, I, I think that this decision is very interesting. We will see in the uh, next meeting of the G20 in India in July, first results. Uh, I, I would uh, look to your question uh, a little bit in a, in a uh, longer perspective. Um, so what happened, uh, and I think this is mostly uh, because of the new U.S. administration, uh, the, the current U.S. administration, is that we had um, a moment of uh, relaunch of multilateralism and of the role of the G20. Um, two very simple examples. First, the decision on uh, special drawing rights. Um, and second, uh, the decision, the agreement on global uh, taxation. These two things that were decided in uh, 2020 uh, and 2021 uh, were the consequence of uh, a strong commitment coming from uh, the US administration and also a change uh, in relation to the previous US administration, uh, which was not um, uh, in the, on the same line, both on SDR and on the global uh, taxation agreement. So good, uh, good results, etc. Then the war came, the consequences of the war, meaning the strong dollar, the food uh, crisis, and the energy crisis, of course. All this has different consequences in the advanced economies and in the global south. And here, of course, we uh, measure the limits despite this uh, significant progress that were made uh, at the start of this decade. We measure the limits of the, of the mechanism because indeed, as you said, our common framework to address the debt of, uh, of low-income low country is working, but, well, we are working with the two or three countries since two or three years. And, uh, uh, and the difficulty to agree on this subject with China is always uh, there. And even uh, the issue of these uh, special drawing rights uh, is not done. You know that we took the commitment of 100 uh, billion. Uh, and yes, well, I'm quite proud on the fact that 27 billion were uh, uh, delivered, not pledged by um, Europeans. Uh, on this uh, package, but the implementation is slow. So if I look to this picture, I see significant progress, the potentiality of a relaunch of multilateralism, and then the war um, showing very clearly that despite the progress, we are not yet with a uh, sufficiently strong mechanism. Yeah, just to explain, the, the reference was with the special drawing rights was the pledge that they would be used by the advanced economies that received the bulk of the allocation to fund the subsidy accounts, the newly formed subsidy accounts, the uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust and the Poverty Re Reduction and Growth Trust in exactly. the IMF. And uh, so far, the there's been a start, but a, lo a long way to go. Exactly. Uh, then to, might have, let me ask the, the following. Is the expectation now in the new Congress of the United States that the U.S. participation in the tax equalization uh, uh, for corporate taxation is not feasible? Well, I'm not entering in... <laughs> 
uh, in the uh, I didn't American. Think you would. <laughs> uh, what I can work, what I I can uh, tell you, uh, Doctor Lipsky, is that I was um, directly uh, uh, involved <laughs> in all these decisions, yes. also because it was honestly not an easy game to reach unanimity on this agreement among uh, European countries. And on taxation, we need unanimity. Uh, so a single European country can veto uh, uh, an agreement on taxation. And um, being so involved, I can testify the fact that uh, Secretary Yellen has been extraordinarily uh, uh, important in unblocking uh, this deal uh, in contributing to, to reach the deal during the Italian presidency of the G20. It was in, in Venice, nice uh, location. <laughs> and um, I know that she's uh, committed to, to this uh, goal. Uh, then, of course, the political situation is complex, of course. Yes. Another one, uh, another one of uh, Sector Yellen's uh, focus has been on the reform of the especially multilateral development banks and their dedication to a greater extent to what are called around here these days global public goods. Uh, is this something, uh, and I think we, what we've seen here so far in Washington, number one, an uncertainty about exactly what does that mean in operational terms, and number two, a response by many of the uh, traditional recipients of or borrowers from the multilateral institutions to say this is all well and good, but if it detracts from the ability of these institutions to provide their existing lines of finance, we don't see why this is such a good thing. Uh, first, do you have a, a view on, the, on yeah. the issue? And secondly, a prognosis on whether anything is going to really be resolved? Well, I, in my view, uh, and I, I, from this point of view, I, I fully share uh, Secretary Yellen's view, is that we need a balance. Um, because, of course, the, the uh, country-based intervention of the MDBs, of, the multi, of, the, of these uh, institutions, uh, cannot be uh, stopped or um, uh, limited. Uh, it, it is still uh, essential, and the demand uh, of um, countries is increasing, uh, the demands of uh, support, the demand of loans, and the quality uh, of these loans remain essential. Translating, these institutions need to keep the triple A uh, to make uh, possible the fact that what they are borrowing uh, is useful for the countries they are uh, supporting. One side. The other side, do we need a more broad um, intervention in support of public goods? Do we need some step towards, um, there is, I don't know if you are aware of this uh, uh, initiative that is called Bridgeton uh, Initiative uh, from the Barbados um, um, launched by, the, by by Barbados leader uh, to create a fund in support of some common uh, goals. Well, I think this is something that the European Commission is uh, supportive of. But of course, we, we, we can't transform uh, these bodies, these institutions, in an institution that are not supporting country by country with lines of credit and support, because this would be very dangerous in this situation. At the same time, the demand for more uh, uh, global commitment on common goods is 
uh, really uh, warrant. And I must say, a slight editorial remark, uh, from the very first of the G20, every communique, I think, from the first, has admonished the MDBs to coordinate uh, and establish a common strategy. Uh, it's, it hasn't really happened so far. Do you think that it can be made to happen this time, especially in this moment uh, in which there's going to be a new uh, World Bank president soon? Well, I think so. First, because we, we should be optimistic. And second, because they, there is an enormous pressure and demand. And third, because there is competition. Uh, there are other uh, subjects that are uh, providing uh, support, uh, financial support to countries. And I think that uh, the World Bank and the IMF are fully aware of this. Their role is crucial. But they are not alone in, the, in this kind of global picture. I, I think there is a sense that there's, uh, the tectonic plates are shifting, to use an overworked cliche, and that the, the institutions need to, uh, need to adjust, but also they need direct, clear direction from their major shareholders. Yes, which is not always uh, easy, easy. No, because <laughs> if you look to the, to exactly. the number of shareholders, yeah. Let me turn briefly in, in one other direction. Uh, one of the concerns in the current moment has been the potential uh, worries about financial stability. Of course, in the wake of the global financial crisis, one of the other institutional innovations was the creation of the Financial Stability Board and uh, great efforts that were made to try to eliminate the kind of causes, especially capital deficiencies, that were seen as important as um, uh, as a cause of that of that crisis, we've had some dramatic events in the states. Three bank failures. Uh, one, the 16th largest bank in the in America, the famous Silicon Valley Bank failing. We've had the the crypto uh, uh, disasters, I guess we could call it. Uh, and on the European side, uh, the failure, the sudden failure of uh, of Credit Suisse, and in the case of Credit Suisse, that the, a lot of effort had been made post-crisis to create a framework for re resolution of systemically important financial institutions that was not used at this time, creating questions about, on the U.S. side, the adequacy of regulation and supervision, on the European side, whether all this effort to create a resolution mechanism is real, and at the same time, the, uh, the message of the crypto side is that there continues to be growth of non-bank financial institutions that lie outside the traditional perimeter of regulation. How do we stand? How big is the risk to financial stability? And what do you, from a European view, what needs to be done? Well, in my view, uh, the, the uh, the situation of our our uh, uh, financial system and our banking system uh, improved a lot since uh, the time of the financial crisis. Um, uh, what is, of course, uh, to to be considered is that, despite this fact, um, we had this uh, very different crisis in the uh, US and in Switzerland, which is, by the way, a, a very European country, but not <laughs> a member of the EU. Um, well, the, the easy answer is that these crises were uh, high, uh, high, uh, well, uh, high, high idiosyncratic. Well, they were the single episodes, uh, and it is true. Um, at the same time, I think they were also telling us that uh, working on 
uh, our regulation is still needed. Uh, I'm not entering in, uh, in the US situation, but for sure in Europe we have to work to complete our banking union, which is something that uh, we worked on uh, and then it, the work is not finished. Um, um, will everything is then something that you have to measure with the unpredictability of the situation, uh, with the dangers coming from crypto assets. Some of these uh, US regional banks uh, were particularly uh, affected by uh, crypto assets. Um, so, um, you have to do this job, even knowing that you, you will never be sure 100% that this uh, is um, completely uh, excluding a single isolated crisis. But if you have the system as it is now, more robust, more liquid, in Europe, it is incredibly different from 15 years ago. And we have the Basel III uh, rules that are in Europe, as you know, uh, involving all banks, not the main 10 or 15 banks. So we have a lot of guarantees, uh, and we have to improve. We, we are working, as you know, in uh, also new mechanism of uh, common resolution of crisis in the European Union uh, that will be discussed in the coming weeks. So st still much to be done, but a uh, largely better situation than the one we had uh, 15 years ago. So no, no need for new sets of institutions keep working, that we're working along the correct yeah, lines? And I would say so. Okay. The, uh, moving to a few other topics, let's talk for a minute about trade. Uh, the new G7 uh, statement uh, calls for even more sanctions uh, against Russia. And uh, in other words, a broadening of the sanctions regime how do you place this in the context of where the uh, where the global trading system is is headed and how it should be headed? Is the WTO going to be resurrected as an effective body, or is that impossible in the current circumstances? Well, my take is that we need to uh, re-strengthen WTO. And that uh, we, we are not in favor of uh, transforming the need of securing our supply chains in some uh, strategic sector. We don't want to transform this in a uh, global reduction of trade. I know that this is uh, easier to to say than to practice, but I also look to the fact that the, the general um, atmosphere is not an atmosphere of, uh, it is an atmosphere of uh, trying to secure supply chains on strategic uh, sectors. And for the first time since years, this is happening also uh, for the European Union. Uh, the European Union talking about strategic autonomy, talking about industrial policy is something quite new uh, in relation to what uh, we uh, were uh, five or ten years ago. But this is not in contradiction with the fact that I don't see a perspective of global growth without a strong global trade. It is, I think, an illusion. So how can we combine the necessity of having more secure supply chain in some sectors with the necessity of keeping alive global trade? Yeah. Inevitably, there will be claims 
that it's an excuse for protection. Yeah. And now in a situation in which the WTO dispute, dis, uh, dispute resolution mechanism is moribund, is, is that, is that going to work? Well, I think it is a matter of political uh, will, will, because yes. of course we will have a, a sort of uh, race to, uh, industrial race to clean technology. Uh, involving all the main uh, economic actor in the world, Europe, US, China, others. Um, but, and so the rare uh, earth, the, the, the strategic materials, etc., etc., the, the relaunch of mining. But all this has to do with uh, having more secure supply chains and not with a uh, protectionist attitude. In this take, uh, the risking and not decoupling, I think there is a resume in a certain sense of what the EU is trying to work for. I, I like that phrase. Now, is it going to be possible, for example, to reach a satisfactory situation with your US allies over the so-called Inflation Reduction Act and the aspects that were so objectionable to its European partners? Well, I think we are, we are working, uh, as you work among friends, uh, to try to identify some aspects uh, that uh, we can um, uh, tweak. We know that, of course, this is a... Uh, a political decision taken, the Congress, etc. But there are some margin of interpretation. We are working on them together. Uh, I think there is a lot of goodwill because we know that uh, among partners, again, a balance. Uh, I am not completely happy with this term uh, of friends shoring because it could mean that uh, you have trade relations on, only among like-minded countries, which is not what we are uh, working for. If I think to the future of Europe, I imagine that we have to look at it in a, not only in a horizontal way, meaning Europe, Russia, but also in a vertical way, meaning Europe, Mediterranean, the Gulf and Africa, 2.5 billion people in 15 years uh, from now, and here is the future. And so the, this is not French oring. This is cooperation between uh, different areas of the world. But keeping very strong cooperation among like-minded countries, and first of all among between Europe and US is crucial for all this mechanism. So I think everybody is aware of this. Um, we will not have a subsidies race. Um, we will have an industrial race to, uh, to clean technology, for sure. But we yeah. can do this among partners, among like-minded, without compromising what is of course, for us, crucial, which is our transatlantic partnership. Excellent. I think uh, one more question, and then I turn to the to the audience. Um, you've had a, some rather high visibility visits to Beijing of European officials, Monsieur President Macron, the uh, uh, Madame Van der Leyen, uh, Mr. Michel, your close colleagues. And the press has feasted on the notion that it looks like there are multiple, you, the open strategic autonomy involves multiple views on crucial issues. Is that uh, a misunder misunderstanding or is this making mountains out of molehills or are there real issues? Well, I don't think you are surprised that we have different uh, views in, in the European Union. It's not a, a scoop. <laughs> uh, 
um, we had we have also now I think today the the German um, foreign minister who is visiting uh, Beijing uh, but overall look again I, I was referring in my um, previously to what happened uh, during the after the annexation of Crimea no? and here and there we had really uh, a, a different world. Uh, we were uh, in the last last moment of the period of the great illusion. Um, the illusion that, that the German term is Wandel uh, durch uh, Handel, no? That you change through trade. And this um, way was still there uh, eight, nine years ago. Uh, this is finished. Uh, there are no doubts. So, of course, strategic autonomy means that Europe has its own economic interest, its own uh, necessity to secure supply chain, but it is also very clear that this has to be done in cooperation uh, with our partners and that the transatlantic alliance is stronger than before. Uh, and this is true for uh, Annalena Baerbock, for Emmanuel Macron, for Charles Michel, for <laughs> Ursula von der Leyen. They are all aware of the fact that the transatlantic alliance is more important now than it was a few years ago. So I think that a, of course, uh, it's interesting to note the, the, the small differences, but the big picture is that we have a strong alliance between EU and US, uh, and this strong alliance uh, doesn't mean that we are not uh, pursuing our uh, autonomous economical interest, which is, of course, normal for US and for the European Union. Thank you very much. Well, I, of course, I could go on and on. This is fascinating for me. It's a, such a such a treat. But uh, now it's time to turn to the audience and see. Uh, there's some questions, and uh, please identify yourself. And keep your questions, uh, real questions, and uh, away we go. Please here. I don't know. Do we? Uh, I think we just re we'll rely on on, my on your <laughs> forceful personality. Jeffrey Shot. Question that arises will be challenged is can the United States or Europe obtain the support for the military and economic for out generating more funds, maybe of the Russian funds, perhaps frozen uh, assets of bank dedicating construction uh, of this. Do you have a view on? Uh, possible that action. I would say two things. First, that we will, in any case, uh, continue as long as needed to support uh, Ukraine um, economically uh, and. Um, uh, the refugees support to uh, ammunition, which is the the big challenge of these months. This is independent from the uh, second part of my answer, um, because I don't want to give the impression that if we don't solve the second part, we uh, our uh, support is at risk in some way. Our support is there, and will stay there as long as it is needed. Um, we are working, uh, the, the Commission uh, services, uh, on uh, the legal uh, possibility to use uh, 
uh, frozen assets, both private and uh, public, meaning the, the, the Russian central bank. Um, it is, of course, from a uh, legal point of view, uh, not an obvious uh, issue, uh, but I'm, I am very uh, confident on the quality of our legal uh, team <laughs> and, and legal services, and I hope that um, they will find a way, because, of course, especially when we think to the reconstruction uh, the possibility to have a solid way to use these assets would be very important. But of course, we have to do this in respect of the international uh, legal uh, framework. For sure, um, China is a, a competitor mm, as far as the promotion of values is concerned. Um, at the same time, I think we should consider uh, also the evolution of uh, our um, economic relation and trade relation with China, uh, where I think the European Union gradually um, um, built on uh, lesson learned uh, in these relations and is gradually uh, working to have a uh, less unequal uh, economic relations. Uh, so, yes, indeed, you were mentioning a, a, an important meeting that took place in 2016 or 2017. Uh, where many European countries were uh, represented. Um, and it was the launch of this uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. Uh, after uh, six, seven years, uh, what we can say is that, well, the, the potentialities of this proposal did not uh, fully materialize, to be a little bit diplomatic. And you, and you are right that we launched this uh, gateway initi initiative exactly uh, to uh, provide, um, well, it's not only competing, it's saying that we Europeans uh, should think, especially towards Africa, but not only Africa, uh, to the future relation with the, uh, what we call the Global South in the real European way, which is the possibility to share technologies, to, to share be best practice, which is not exactly the way uh, the Belt and Road Initiative functions. So it is a different model. If we look to our future to have this kind of more cooperative and inclusive model in the relation with the Global South is absolutely strategic. Um, uh, so we are not doing the same thing in a competitive way. We are trying to do it in the European way. Last question. Commissioner Gentiloni, if you'll allow me to ask a question of Christopher Poole. Um, wow. 
pandemic, <laughs> the pandemic seemed to, at least summer of 2020, the slow end of border change southern border China within Europe is crystal clear. And the situation you would set up now, of course, would be to how can we adapt the old rules pre pandemic, pre Ukraine, the new world? What are the prospects for that? And water still seems to be very deep, still what Germany wants, what wants. How, how is it? Uh, where do you think, where, where do you see us land? Uh, well, we need another conversation to enter <laughs> into this so uh, simple topic. Uh, subject uh, in the details. The answer, in in my view, is quite simple, uh, and it is in the in the very name of what we call the Stability and Growth Pact. So, what we need is an instrument, uh, and this is what we are working for: reviewing our fiscal rules that both guarantee a credible, uh, realistic uh, path of debt reduction. And it is inevitable that this path is uh, differentiated among different member states. And at the same time, providing an incentive for investments. Uh, if I may add to this a comment, which is also related to the discussion we are having in these uh, days here in Washington. Um, financial stability is the conditio sine qua non, is the premise. If you don't have financial stability, it's very difficult to have the ambition. But at the same time, we need a lot of growth. Um, if we look to the mountain of investments that are needed in the what we refer to with the green transition, with the innovation, with the cooperation with the global south, we need economies uh, capable to increase skills, to innovate, to be leading in the green transformation so all this is not only connected to financial stability. Financial stability is the premise, but we need fiscal rules that are also contributing to incentivize investments. And this is the future of Europe. If we want Europe to be competitive, the, the issue of competitiveness is not only the Inflation Reduction Act. This would be really ridiculous. No, our competitiveness is connected to uh, energy prices, innovation, uh, capacity to uh, invest. This is our competitiveness. Then, of course, there is the global uh, environment and also different initiatives taken by the other countries. So we need rules that guarantee stability and credible uh, path of debt reduction, but at the same time, incentives to invest and reform. Productivity means reforms. Well, that was a great way to... Uh, I didn't get the, the second one, but I am, uh, I am. Well, the, the, the structural funds uh, are a very important component of the being members of the EU. Uh, we are working very hard with the Ukrainian authority to make this happen. But of course, we don't have a, a, a clear timeline. Uh, what impressed me very much is how much the Ukrainian authorities are committed for this. We had a visit of the 
college of the European Commission a couple of months ago in Kyiv, and we spent seven hours with the Ukrainian government discussing each and every file of the future accession to the EU. And for us to see a government which is under uh, a war uh, discussing customs union, uh, the, 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 the single files of the, how the EU functions was really impressive and even moving. So we are working very hard to make this possible as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And join me. It's quite a, quite a treat and an honor. And thank you so much. <laughs>